All right, Scott. Scott, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Uh, right outside of Nashville, Tennessee, a little town called Columbia. And tell me about your family growing up. You had both was, your parents? Uh, both parents, they got divorced when I was about 13. Uh, dad was in Vietnam. Mom's school teacher. Dad, heavy PTSD from the war, alcoholic. Uh, really hammered down on us in the family. What kind of, what kind of childhood was it? Oh, horrific. There's child abuse and then there's torture. This guy would flip out a lot, do things like go out, just go out into the street, shoot the street lights out. Uh, he had things that he called attitude adjusters. It was like a leather, it was a wooden handle with a leather strap and like 30 pieces of, of rawhide leather. And that was our disciplinary tool from age three to 12. And uh, he would use switches with thorns, hit us 25, 30 times. I remember my brother standing beside the door just counting how many times I would get hit, mentally pre uh, preparing himself for what was to come for him. And uh, it, it, it really fucked me up. It, it stuck with me till now, I'm 46 years old. Uh, a lot of the old man would always say, pull your bootstraps up and be a man, but I never saw him do that. He still drinks from the bottle. He's born in 1946 and uh, still drinks heavy. Do you think this was a product of him going to Vietnam? or you think I think like it was his upbringing. I don't know much about my family. I don't know much about his grandfather. I know he had a family. My grandfather was born in 1900. He had a family before. Uh, he had m my dad and my brother. He had two daughters. And during the Depression, they, the family got broken up. He had to move up north with his four brothers to Gary, Indiana and work for U.S. Steel. And uh, then he met my grandma that was born in 1910. And they lived and worked up there for U.S. Steel for 30, 40 years with his four brothers. And some of his brothers retired out of there. And then when he retired, he moved back down to Kentucky and was a prison guard. And from bits and pieces that I picked up from my mom, I assume both hit you know, it, it was just the time back then. It was a hard time. I'd ask my mom, like she said, when she first met him, you know, then being born during 1900, 1910, growing up in the depression, no electricity, no air conditioning in Kentucky and Tennessee, outhouses, tough people, things of that nature. I, I'm sure they endure a lot of physical abuse, a lot of hard times. That's just the way it was back then. Yeah. So you made it through high school? Yes. What kind of kid were you in high school? Uh, skateboarder, punk rocker. Hmm. The abuse was given out to everybody in your family? Yes. Something? Me, my brother, my first cousin, my mom, my, my dad and my uncle cut from the same cloth. I never really knew my granddad because he passed away when I was like five years old. And from what I've gathered, he was a really mean person, really sadistic. I've known people, I've known veterans that have gone to the war and seen some real horrific stuff and they're real loving people. They don't physically abuse their families. My dad would do real sadistic stuff. Like he grew up on a farm. Um, so he was raised, you know, out in the woods. And I understand that, you know, killing rabbits, things of that nature is a part of a way of living to survive, but then there's a sadistic part of it. I remember, like for instance, when I was 14 years old, we had, uh, he lived in the country and he had um, two neighbors and he didn't like them because they were lesbians. So he wanted to prove a point to them. They had three dogs, I'm 14 years old. My brother's a year and a half older than me. The dogs kept coming on the property and he just shot them in front of us and told us, he shot the three dogs and then told us he was drunk, pick the dogs up and put them in the back of the truck and drive them up the top of the hill and just dump them. And I told him, I don't, I don't want to take no part of that. Then he pointed his gun at me and told me, like, pick the dog up or you're next. You know, and I'm 13, 14 years old in the middle of the country. We're like 30 minutes from any kind of store. So I just got to do what the guy says, you know. So that's the kind of sh bullshit that I dealt with. So I made it up in my mind through my teenage years that I always wanted to live out here 
I was influenced by the skateboarding and the punk rock community. I take pictures out of the Thrasher magazine, put them up on my wall and just daydream about living in California. So when the time came, late 19, early 20, I moved out here with just $300 in a backpack and started in Skid Row, lived in a homeless shelter, got a job at a hotel doing night auditing, things of that nature, just things to survive. When I was in high school, I would, I, I did do like hallucinogenic, uh, like hallucinogenic drugs, like uh, DXM, Robitussin, LSD, magic mushrooms, things of that nature. But I never really got into the hard stuff like cocaine or crystal meth. It was more experimental, a way to escape, a way to heal, a way to like calm all that abuse that was coming in. The way I look at it, probably my dad and his uncle had a lot of childhood abuse. And then on top of that, he went to Vietnam, no telling what he saw over there. So that just probably, you know, stacked on top of it. So he just came back home a mess. You know, a lot of guys come back home from Vietnam. A lot of guys come back home from all kinds of wars, but they're not at home. They're still at the war. I've heard, heard all kinds of stories about their wives and husbands going to the grocery store with the family coming back and putting groceries in the car. And then the husband would hear like a, a car backfire like a gunshot and just hit the ground and just freeze, crawl under the car for two or three hours, things like that. Uh, they, I didn't know anything about PTSD. I didn't get any kind of therapy when I was in my teenage years. I just used drugs as like a therapy to escape from all that. And uh, around May of 2009, my first cousin, which I think is my half brother now, I don't know because of the family so secretive, murdered his family and uh, ended up shooting he had three sons. He had a 13 year old son. He had an eight year old son and a five month old baby. He sh uh, shot the eight year old son, shot the five month old baby, shot the wife and then killed himself. Fired two shots at the 13 year old. The 13 year old survived, still living today. He's probably about 26, 27 years old. I don't have communication with him. Tried to reach out to him a couple times, but the family brainwashes him because they know I broke away from the family. I came out here to California to get away from all their bullshit and all their brainwashing and all their lies. And from what I understand, from what I heard through the grapevine, he had therapy for about six months after the shooting. And then they just stopped making him go. I heard he got arrested for using marijuana. And then my uncle and my aunt, which is his grandparents had custody of him at the time, just kicked him out of the house and sent him with his biological mother. At the time of the murders, he was living with a stepmom. And so he goes to live with his biological mom. I hit him up when he's like 17 years old, tell him, I know he's into skateboarding. I told him I got a skateboard for you. You know, I'd you know, like to make a connection with you. He pretty much told me like the family's told me you're crazy. I don't really want to have any part of you. So I just stepped back and I, I told myself, he'll understand how the dynamic of the family works when he gets older and I won't intervene, I won't interfere, I won't try to reach out to him. Lo and behold, 10 years later, he's like 26, 27, he don't have much to do. He's pretty much seeing how the family dynamic is and how they function, they're lying cowards. I've tried to get a hold of him multiple times. I call my uncle, hey, uh, how you doing? This is your nephew. He'll just straight up hang up on me. I'll call my aunt. She'll hang up on me. They don't want to talk to me. They don't want to face me. I don't understand. I've reached out to multiple family members. I don't understand why they want to, don't want to talk to me. I haven't had anything to do with them really since the mid nineties. Whatever went down in the fam family dynamic, however traumatized they are from what my cousin did, I can understand that, but I never did anything wrong. The blowback that I, the, that I hear through the family uh, is that everybody thinks that I'm, they don't really know me because when I moved out here in the late nineties, I just disconnected for the, from the whole family and didn't really talk to any of them and didn't really talk. I was real tight with my cousin. We had like a trauma bonding type thing. We were tight like brothers growing up. But after I got out here, I just disconnected and I was just in a mode of survival. And uh, 10, 11, 12 years went by and I reconnected with him. 
about a year before he killed his family. So we had a, like a year of a relationship that was going down and, uh, and it went well, you know, still the same thing with the family dynamic. I could still see he was struggling with drugs and alcoholism, trying to cope and trying to heal his trauma. And then, uh, you know, I, I moved back to Tennessee to try to go through a nursing program, to try to get out of the streets here, to try to get out of the daily grind, to try to better myself. So I thought I'd go to nursing school. So it was around April of 2008 that I moved back there. And that's when I started to develop a, a relationship with my, my cousin and we, we got tight. And I was in that area for about 18 months. And I was at school one day on a Thursday. We always had like a family routine, a family ritual, because he lived in Florida, I lived in Tennessee, where we would always talk on a Sunday. And we would just, you know, bond like brothers and stuff and try to get together as much as we could. That's all I really knew. And uh, he called me on a Thursday. I could tell something was wrong. And I was in class taking a test. And I told him, hey, call me on Sunday like we always do. And he said, okay. Well, that Sunday came around. I didn't. I never heard a phone call. So I felt something funny in my system. I couldn't go to sleep. The next morning, I get a phone call. Uh, it was always uh, like an inside joke with the family that I put the old man's nickname in my phone as Satan because he's so mean and sadistic. So I was in a shower on Monday morning and I got a missed call from Satan. And I'm like, oh, it's my dad. What's he doing calling? And so I called him back. He answers the phone. He says, all he says to me is this right here. Oh, it's bad. And I said, what are you talking about? It's bad. He said, your cousin, Troy, turn on the TV. And then he just hangs the phone up. So I turn on the TV. It's on MSNBC, CNN, all the major news stations that he killed his family. What the story that went down and in the first week of May of 2009 and the weeks to come, it went all over the newspapers nationwide. It was in papers in Seattle, it was in the LA Times, it was in the front page of the paper of the little town I grew up in. This happened in Tennessee? Yeah. And so after that, I shut down. I, I, I went, my body went into shock. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep for a week. The trauma, everything triggered again and I just stopped functioning. So that was around May and I still had to tie my school up. But when you get traumatized, when you go through physical or sexual abuse as a child, no matter how gifted you are, no, ma no matter how intelligent you are, that trauma takes over and it becomes a fog in your mind where you can't concentrate on your studies. So you start to fall behind no matter how intelligent you are, no matter how high your marks are in the scholastic test that you're taking, no matter how far ahead, no matter how quick you catch on to the material, the trauma affects you. And, and it's still with me. I'm, like I said, I'm 46, 47 years old. And my whole life story is about how do I get rid of this trauma? How do I heal this trauma? How can I help myself? And then how can I help other people? I've tried to get into other jobs all through my 20s. I would get various jobs. I'd hold them for six months to a year, and then I'd get triggered. The boss would say something that would sound like what the, the tone that my dad would use. And then, you know, I would catch myself being outside of work waiting for this guy. And, and why am I outside waiting for this guy? And, you know, I'd want to fuck him up, you know, and just the, all the stuff would kick in. And I never understood that. So I went through my 20s and to my early 30s where I would just have like a slew of jobs where I'd hold them six months to a year. I never used drugs. I was just so traumatized. I didn't really understand what was going on. And then when my cousin murdered the family, all that kicked back in. My brother called me on the phone. He told me uh, I, after I moved out here, like I said, I was going to school in May of 2009. So it was around September that I moved back out to LA and started over. My brother bought me a plane ticket to come out here. I had a hundred bucks. I came out here, checked into Union Station Homeless Shelter in Pasadena and just started my life over. It was then my brother was talking to me on the phone and told me he was getting a lot of counseling for 
what was going on in our childhood. And he recommended that I go to a therapist and, and start getting involved. So I got um, involved with Union Station Pasadena. They hooked me up with a case manager. They gave me a social worker. I started getting into therapy. I started learning that when you get abused as a child, physically or sexually, it rearranges the chemistry in your mind. And it, it really does a whole number on you. It, it, it rearranges the chemicals in your mind. It rearranges the chemistry in your body. And it really fucks you up. And I had to get with therapists and had to reprogram. I had to relearn how to be a human being again. So they took me in. I lived in a shelter there for about a year. And then they got me into a SRO and I lived in a SRO around Pasadena and around downtown LA for about five years. And then after that, I got um, into a, a nice apartment for about seven years. So since my cousin murdered his family, I've just been focused on trying to heal myself from the trauma and, and figure out what the what is really going on in my mind? It's it's a huge fog that I just had to step back from. I, I stepped out of the workforce when I was 31 years old. So I haven't really, I, I started to try to build a career as a truck driver. I got my commercial driver's license. I drove trucks for about 10 years. Same thing kept happening. I'd keep jobs for about six months and then would quit and, and would just break down, lay, lay down on my couch. What, what's wrong with me? And then I'd hear blowback from the family. Oh, you're just a lazy piece of shit. You don't want to work. What's going on? I, I didn't understand therapy and stuff like that, like I said. And then after my cousin murdered his family and after I dropped out of the workforce, I started learning from these therapists. No, you have PTSD, just like a war veteran from the child abuse of what was going on in your life. So my life has taken a turn. These days, what I like to do is be a pastor counsel those that are in the streets, that are addicted to drugs, that are heavily traumatized, that people that got physically and, and, and sexually abused and went through similar circumstances like I did, because that, to me, that's the only thing really worth doing on this planet. You can have materials, you can be, you can get your PhDs, you can be a CEO, and you can you could do these major things and you could have multiple houses, but what is that really going to do to you when your soul leaves your body? Nothing. In my mind, it's the work you do, the seeds you plant into people's hearts, because I believe our souls are dwelling in these temporary vessels that are temporary. And everything we build in this world is temporary, like a house, a car, our bodies. So, the only thing that really matters is what you're doing to someone's soul, how you're interacting with other people on a daily basis, how you're helping them, how you're putting your energy out there into the world and what kind of person you're being to other people and what kind of relationship you have with God. That's all that really matters in this temporary world that we live in. And that's what I'm really living for today. That's great. That's wonderful to hear. What, what what ways did this, what you went through in your childhood, affect you as an adult? I mean, were you like self- Like I said, I, I, I would get jobs. I, I never did. I did drugs through high school. When I got out here, I was living on the streets. I didn't have any family. I didn't have any friends. I didn't have any connections. So I didn't have time to do drugs. I just went into straight survival mode. And what the therapist has taught me that that was a trauma in itself, being homeless, coming out here and living on the streets. So I had trauma from my childhood. Then I had trauma from living on the streets out here and just being in raw survival mode for 10 years, trying to just figure out what was going on. And then in my late 20s, early 30s, I just shut down one day and just broke down after my cousin killed his family. I was you know, 31, 32 years old, and I just stopped functioning. And I just, it was like I became catatonic. And then that's when my brother stepped in. You, you have to get therapy. You have to understand what trauma does to your system. It's everything in this world is based on energy. And when you get abused by other people, it's energy that you're taking on to your soul, to your, what I call like my jacket, 
We all have a jacket and what you're putting onto your jacket, your soul jacket is energy. Everything in this world is based on energy. And that's what scientists teach you. It's all based on how molecules and particles vibrate. Energy can be created. It can be destroyed. And you learn these things through physics and through the second law of therm thermodynamics and things like that. So you have to look at things as a soul. You have to look at things as energy. And that's what I'm focusing on today. That's great. How, how is this? How, are, how have your relationships been since you've been? I, I, I've, I've, I've had girlfriends. It's hard to keep relationships because I isolate a lot. And, and then the, like the jobs, the relationships just fall by the wayside and I end up becoming a recluse. I just isolate in my apartment. So after the murders and, uh, and the suicide of the family, I got a therapist. They put me on disability and uh, I'm just focusing on how I can utilize the gifts that God gave me to put it back out into the community and heal myself so I can heal other people. So before I got into hardcore therapy, I was just isolating in my apartment. Still to this day, it's just a lot of isolation. I just stay to myself. Uh, I never really had friends. I looked up to people, you know, like Henry Rollins has a lot of that going on. He has a similar story to me where he's kind of like a reclusive type character. So these were my heroes growing up. Mickey Rourke, the actor, similar story. A lot of physical abuse going on. And I always strive to be like people like Henry, people like Mickey that had a voice that stood back, stepped back and overcame all that abuse and, and gave back to the community. So it's interesting that you can keep your, uh, just keep yourself together as well as you have. Right. With everything you've been through. Right. How, how are your siblings handling it? Uh, same. I, uh, my brother, alcoholic, he's, he admitted to me, he started drinking when he was about 14. I started using drugs when I was about 14. Uh, I, I, I used drugs from 14 to 19 when I moved out here and then I got saved. And uh, I, I started developing a relationship with God. So that took place of the drugs. And it was God that walked me through everything when I first got out here. Like when I came out here, I had a backpack and $300. And I got off the, the bus at the, at the Greyhound bus station just right down the street here. And, you know, my heart's pounding in my chest so hard that I could hear it in my ears. I could feel my pulse in my ears. I could feel the pulse in my teeth and, and I'm just a, a kid with a backpack and I don't know what to do. So what do I turn to? I didn't turn to drugs. So I, I just would say quiet prayers to myself, like God help me get through this. And I would hear a small voice in me, talk to me and guide me through these things. You don't know these streets. You don't know any people here, but I do. I built these streets. I, I know all the people that you need to go to and that voice, which is God, guided me to these people that I needed to go to, got me a job, got me an apartment. And that's what I've used as my navigation throughout my adult life instead of picking up drugs and, you know, escaping through drugs. I just escape into the Holy Spirit. I get my healing resting in the Holy Spirit. It's when people do crystal meth, when people take a shot of heroin, you feel this warm being come over you like someone's hugging you and it's love. And that's what God is. God is love. So when you accept the Holy Spirit into your heart, the Holy Spirit comes into you and gives you that same feeling that drugs do, that warm feeling. So you don't need drugs. So a lot of my ministry, a lot of my therapy that I do with people is, you know, it's, it's easier said than done. But if we could teach people not to take the drugs and to just take the hits off the Holy Spirit, I think the world would be a lot better place. But it's, it's a real hard dynamic. And as I've talked to you on the phone, a lot of people that I counsel will always blame God. Well, if there's a God, how can God allow you to go through all the child abuse that you went through? How could God allow the Holocaust to go on? How could God allow all the people to be living on the streets and murdering people all the time? But it's not God. You, you gotta understand that God created angels and you have to understand the history of creation 
and how that all came about and where human beings are in the standpoint of that and how angels became jealous of human beings and how God views human beings above angels. And to me and to a lot of people that study the Bible, that's the devil got jealous of human beings and that's what kicked off a war in heaven. And he convinced a third of the angels up there to come down with him and get away from God. And then they became cast out of heaven and into this world and they became the rulers of this world. So would you say that you're able to find happiness at this point? Through, through God, yes. Through the Holy Spirit, I've always been able to find happiness, but it's still a struggle. I still have that trauma, that energy on my jacket. What kind of emotions do you go through? A lot of frustration, a lot of overwhelming emotions, a lot of depression. They say depression is just repressed anger. So what I do a lot, uh, instead of using drugs, I just sleep. So sleep is my drug. I escape through sleep. I isolate in my apartment. It just all becomes so too overwhelming for me. And so I have therapists that are teaching me coping skills to get away from that to where I can utilize the gifts that God gave me to put back out into the community. How often do you see a therapist? Uh, two or three times a week. I, I, I got, after the murders of the family, I got heavy into it for about a year, and then I just got depressed, and then it stopped doing it for five years, and then just got into a heavy depression, and didn't do drugs, but I would escape into sleep. And it's just until recently that I started getting back into the therapy and, and realizing that to be honest, I wanted to kill myself, but I don't have the balls to kill myself. So I would go out and do crazy things and try to get other people to kill me, get into fights and try to get other people to kill me. And, and when that wasn't working, God would keep telling me, I have a plan for your life. You can't keep doing this. And you done prison or jail time? Uh, n never. Never. D my, my, essentially, my apartment, my SRO is a prison cell. So yes, <laughs> it, it is prison. And you get clean from drugs, which is yeah. impressive. Scott, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in your life? How to forgive people. Mo hands down, how to forgive people and how to serve other people is Did the you most important. Did you forgive your dad? Yeah, it took me till I was about 41, 42 years old that I could truly forgive him. You can say you forgive people, but I truly forgive him. And when I forgave him, it released a lot of energy. But there's still a struggle. I didn't talk to him for 12 years after the murders, he didn't want me to come to the funeral. Nobody wanted me to come to the funeral. That really fucked me up. Nobody in the family told me why I couldn't come to the funeral. So I had a lot of that to deal with. So uh, it, it was tough. Uh, I, I got real frustrated. I sent very, very, very violent and, and, and emails telling him I wanted to kill him, things I wanted to do to him out of this frustration. And I regret that. That's not what a Christian man should do. But hey, I, it's still on my jacket. Through those 12 years, I didn't talk to him. It was, wasn't until recently, till about two or three months ago, that we reconnected. He's 76, 77 years old. I basically had the attitude I was going to move out here and just fuck the family. I was just going to let him die off. I was just going to do my own thing and be my own person, but that's no way to be. The Holy Spirit has convicted me to, I should go back and, and just be, uh, the strongest thing someone can do in my personal opinion, in their spiritual walk is truly love someone that's trying to kill you. Someone that has abused you, someone that has physically abused you, someone that has really fucked you over, if you can really go to that person and say, I love you. I've been in court cases where I see gang members kill the sons of mothers that come to court. And these mothers sit there and, and, and look at the gang members and, and say, I truly forgive you for what you did. You murdered my son. I truly forgive you. That's not them. People can't do that. Because human nature by default, uh, we're, we're all fucked up. We're not forgiving people. We're real selfish people. You need the help of God to do something like that. For that woman to hug the, the, the man that murdered her son in a gang and say, I truly forgive you. I love you. That's the power of God intervening and working. When I can pick up the phone and call my dad and have a conversation with him, I can feel the Holy Spirit 
coming in just like a hit of drugs. It's a warmness over my body. It's a real, it's like a hug, a real loving feeling that I get that allows me to communicate with him where I don't, to be honest with you, want to kill him, want to murder him for all the things he did to me and my brother and my mom growing up. All right, Scott, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. I wish you the best of luck. All right. Thank you.